Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Pleasure to be on. We are continuing our series on concubinage in Islam. And last time we looked at the story of Maria. And Dr. Shabir, you provided evidence that showed that Maria could have been married to the Prophet Muhammad. So, so Dr. Shabir, uh, on the flip side, I want to look at some of the arguments that other people might make. So they might say, look, there are all these reports about the fact that Maria was a, a slave, right? And that she was freed after the Prophet Muhammad died. So how does it make sense? How does your argument make sense, given that narrative that we are given within the Hadith reports? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, this is reasonable for us to, it's reasonable for us to look at the flip side, look at the arguments of those who would insist that Maria was a concubine, and uh, see if we can actually deconstruct that. Um, first of all, we should point out that Maria is not mentioned by name in the Quran. Uh, so if we, if we deconstruct that argument, we're not touching the Quran here. Mm. It's, uh, you know, if a Muslim is saying, uh, look, you know, we have a difficulty with this concubinage uh, issue and, uh, you know, what does the Quran say about it? So one cannot, uh, you know, fix Maria into the Quran because she's just not mentioned there. Mm. So we should be clear about that. Now, as for the uh, narratives in Islamic history and so on, uh, we've already seen one side of it indicating and that the Prophet, peace be upon him, can be presumed to have married Maria. But if someone says, no, but this, uh, you know, is established in Islam, she is one of the examples to prove that uh, when a woman is, is kept as a slave girl and she gives the birth to a child for her master, uh, then she automatically becomes freed on, uh, uh, on the death of her master. Mm -hmm. and, and Maria was a prime example of that because after the Prophet, peace be upon him, died, she naturally was declared to be free. Um, well, what we can say is that sometimes uh, we, we have to be careful with, with narratives in Islamic history. And that as, as some scholars have pointed out, um, let me mention um, John Burton as a prime example of this. Uh, sometimes Muslim scholars in the early uh, period wanted precedents to prove a certain law that they were arriving at. Sometimes the law may have been arrived at, at as a reasonable um, uh, principle, uh, but uh, they, they want some grounding in, mm. in a precedent. So they would find it in the life example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, if it's not to be found there, sometimes it was manufactured. Uh, not, not by deliberate cheating, but somebody saying, okay, let's go back, you know, in secrecy and let's manufacture all of these. People did that too, but the careful scholars did not do that. But the careful scholars could have uh, um, let something slip by. Hmm. Um, meaning somebody else might have invented something and then it goes around and comes around be, uh, taking on the appearance of a genuine report that the Prophet, peace be upon him, actually said this and did this. And then the careful scholar even looks at it and is convinced it's a genuine report. They take that, they incorporate that all into the whole system of thought. So something like this could have happened in the case of uh, Maria, where uh, the people need uh, to think about, what about the slave girl who gave birth to a child for her master? Obviously, she's done something good here for, for the Muslim society to begin with. And how can we continue to treat her uh, as a slave, even after the death of her master. Shouldn't she have a special status? Even within the lifetime of her master, she will be treated with some uh, honor and recognition because mm -hmm. uh, she has done a good for her master in bringing a child into the world. And uh, so uh, may maybe even within her lifetime, uh, within the lifetime of her master, she was already treated as a wife. In our general description of concubinage in the wider world, we saw that uh, there were all of these possibilities and, level and levels and gradations of how close uh, a woman might be as a concubine uh, to uh, the wife's status. Um, so having already achieved that status, Maria could have uh, been uh, more widely recognized as being a free person after the death of the prophet, peace be upon him, uh, given the, the, the uh, confines of the Islamic system of thought, some of which I have yeah, it's shown reason to revise in a previous segment. But just looking at it within that, that broad parameter, uh, we can see that uh, Muslim scholars needing a precedent could have thought of this as the precedent and thought that, okay, she became freed by virtue of the fact that she gave birth uh, to the prophet's uh, son. And, uh, and, and this becomes precedent for other such cases as, as well. Uh, so the, the, within that thought system, 
the, the uh, you know, things might have become circular in that she becomes the proof of that principle, uh, but the principle itself may have generated the proof. Mm. Um, and, but how and, can we know? We, we, uh, we can't we, really we tell. We cannot. And this is why people should not insist on a thing like this. So mm. for the modern Muslim who is having great difficulty in thinking, you know, this thing about the man being allowed to sleep with his uh, concubine just because he owns her as a slave girl, uh, this is hard for us to swallow nowadays. So if a Muslim is uh, burdened with this as a real problem, uh, here is uh, one way of thinking about this so that we, we, we are not overburdened with this because we know that uh, the argument can go both ways. Mm. It can be argued this way, it can be counter-argued this way, and even the counter-argument can be deconstructed. And which is what I'm doing now. I'm deconstructing that counter argument. Mm -hmm. So when you say, you know, the the uh, the reports might have been manufactured, do you mean that Maria herself could have been manufactured? Well, uh, assuming that she existed, okay, and she came. That's, that's what I mean. Uh, uh, let, yeah, let, let's let's take that as a, as a two stage approach. As uh, in one stage, we can say let's assume that she existed, as the Islamic tradition says. And she was brought to live with the Prophet, peace be upon him, as the Islamic tradition says. And now we're just asking, was she married to him or, or not? But a deeper level of analysis is, is also possible. You know, academic scholars, some of them have uh, looked into the question of whether the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, actually existed. And uh, there was a European man by the name of Sven Kalish who was mentioned to me in the debates. I was debating with a Christian person and he said, oh, what about Sven Kalish? And I looked into what he had to say. He said that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not exist. But he, he was not taken um, as, as an authority on this question, and uh, it, it did not lead to anywhere. His, the, the, the idea that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not exist uh, is uh, you know, based on some very uh, shoddy uh, sort of uh, scholarship. Nowadays, uh, academic scholars do actually say that the Prophet, peace be upon him, existed, even if they're not uh, agreeing to all of the Islamic tradition about him. Uh, there is another person by the name of Robert Spencer who wrote a book called Did Muhammad Exist? And he is, uh, in a way, suggesting that the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not exist. Like, he goes back and forth and he presents the arguments this way and, and that way. Uh, but what I mean to say about all of this is that in the end, we, we know that the Prophet, peace be upon him, existed because he left so many uh, traces. He left uh, children, he left grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on. So by the time the um, uh, Islamic records are being put together, it's quite clear we're dealing with a person who actually existed in history. Now, when we're dealing with Maria, who's said to have died five years after the Prophet, peace be upon him. That's long before the Islamic traditions were put into writing. So by the time the Islamic traditions are put into writing, she is a vague memory. Hmm. And, uh, and perhaps even one can say, how do we know she actually existed? Perhaps she's not a, even a vague memory. Maybe she is a manufactured memory. And then if we ask, okay, so what, uh, what material uh, traces did she leave behind? Okay, so she had a son. But the son also died uh, in, its in, in his infancy, even before she died. Uh, and if we say, okay, well, you know, uh, this son was said to have been 18 months old when he passed away. This would have been a beloved child in the community. The Prophet, peace be upon him, did not have a son at that time. Uh, previously, it said that he had sons through Khadija, his uh, first wife. But those sons also died in infancy, mm -hmm. which leads to the question, did they actually exist? And now this son, who is said to have been born within the last few years of the Prophet's uh, life, uh, when, you know, he was in his 50s and... Uh, and, uh, and the community was very the, strong uh, as oh, well. Oh, the community would have been so excited about this. Hmm. And uh, everybody would want to touch this child and hold this child. And, and, and if people would be reporting later on, you know, about their experiences of holding this child and, and playing with this baby and so on and watching this baby laugh uh, and, and making the baby laugh. But, uh, we, we find very little mention of Ibrahim uh, later on. Uh, so uh, what, did he actually exist? Or is this really, you know, something that the Muslims are imagining? Uh, and, and we can go into more detail about how people imagine things based on what is mentioned in the Quran. For example, in Surah 33, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. So people could have thought, okay, but maybe he was the father of a child who died in infancy. Hmm. You know, so things like this could actually have, have been invented. 
so what we're saying in a nutshell is not that Mari is an invention or that her son Ibrahim was an invention, but uh, if, if a Muslim is overburdened with this thought that the Prophet, peace be upon him, had a concubine, um, we can counter with, with everything we've said already. And if somebody says, no, it is a fact, we can ask them, how do you know it's really a fact? Prove to us that, that this really is a fact, that she existed and her son existed, and that she was actually kept with the Prophet, peace be upon him, as a concubine, but not as a married wife. I feel like there's so much more we could talk about, Dr. Shabir. Uh, we're going to have to take a break, but we'll come back to the subject again. Thank you. You're welcome. If you enjoyed this video, click like and subscribe. And please donate to support our work at Quranspeaks.com.